Hey everyone, welcome to Film Rush. This is a weekly podcast where two cousins get together and talk about movies. My name is Logan Vaughn, and joining me today is my cousin, John. Hey everyone, I'm John Vaughn. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Welcome to Film Rush. It's another Wednesday. It's another episode. I'm John. That's Logan. How are you doing today, Logan? I'm doing good today, John. It has been a pretty solid weekend for me. How was your weekend? What'd you guys do? Uh, didn't do a whole lot this weekend. Uh, mostly just uh, chilled out, watched uh, a bunch of bunch of stuff off of our streaming services. Um, but yeah, no, it wasn't anything special this weekend. Uh, at least if there was something special, I've blacked out <laughs> Fair uh, of whatever it was um but yeah so we've got something to talk about right at the top here that i know logan hasn't seen but i saw and i know a lot of the world saw but i so i feel like it needs to be discussed um bill and ted face the music is a movie that literally just came out it came out last friday um and i got the opportunity to see it kind of came out of nowhere and i did gotta say i, I told logan that since he hasn't seen the the previous two, uh, there's no real reason to hunt this one down and to get a chance to see it or anything like that. Uh, I, there is, it's not like it's a closed loop and you'll only get the jokes if you've seen the first two Bill and Ted's. It, you'll get them, but the problem is I don't think you'll be as invested in the the silliness of the characters and the, the bizarreness of the world unless you've seen the previous two. And even then, I mean, there's a lot of people that'll that'll see it later in life like you, Logan, uh, that won't necessarily have the, the that nostalgia factor even after you've seen the first two, because obviously you can't be nostalgic for something you just experienced. Um, but I think you'll have a better experience if you've seen the first two over this one. Other than that, this was funny. Like, And my wife's not even that big of a Bill and Ted fan. I think she's only seen one of them. Uh, and she thought it was really funny. Um, probably one of the funniest things we've watched in 2020, to be totally honest. Really? Yeah. Um, and it, it was genuine. Here's the thing. Like a lot of people will watch it and be like, well, I didn't really gut laugh during the whole thing. I think I thought it was so funny was because it felt like whoever wrote the script was just being very genuine, very heartfelt. Cause it's such a simple, very, I can't think of better words, genuine movie. Like Bill and Ted are just simple guys who have a simple goal of save the world like they they want for nothing else other than just to be cool be party and be excellent to each other you know like that's all it is and that that's how this movie's comedy feels as well it's just very it just wants you to have a good time and that's why i think i enjoyed this film a lot i give it like a seven out of ten nice that's exciting uh first off exciting that you got to see a new 2020 movie um yeah right i was like whoa yay because the world's kind of infinitesimally back to kind of sort of normal a little bit for like two hours yeah exactly and uh, i have not seen bill and ted three i haven't seen uh, the first two bill and ted movies i'm super familiar with them but i've never actually seen them before uh so they're on my, I guess, wall of shame uh, is the term for, for where they are right now. But um, I, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. It sounds like one of those movies that is extremely satisfying to the built-in audience, but maybe won't yeah. like It'll, engage with the new audience. It, well, it will never have the same impact, if nothing else. Okay. Like, and that's super fair. Yeah, it's like... It's kind of like how Star Wars didn't really do gangbusters in like the Chinese market and whatnot, um, the like these new Star Wars, the last three. But that's because – I mean they still made money, but they didn't make like big money because the original Star Wars movies didn't premiere or go to China back in the 70s and 80s and whatnot. So they don't have that built-in like obsession – with Star Wars that we in the West here have. So when Star Wars came out, right. you got your sweet ass they for there. access to it later. Ever in China's like, who the fuck is Han Solo? Why do I care that he just got stabbed? I mean, that's sad, I guess. But like, I didn't know this guy. Yeah. Who's Luke? Why is everyone mad? Luke's Why is everyone mad that Luke is mad? I don't understand as a Chinese man. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's why. But I think you, I think you'll like the first two Bill and Ted's. Um, and in, and by the transitive property, I think you will like Bill and Ted 3. 
someday. Cool. All right. I'll I'll keep it on my radar. I uh, uh if I found out that Bill and Ted were just like readily available on a platform, then I would probably watch them over the next couple of weeks and try to catch Bill and Ted three sometime soon. Because I mean, th- those are I've, I've heard they're really silly, stupid kind of comedies, but still really uh, enjoyable to certain folks. And I feel like I might be in that group who would enjoy it. So I, I want to watch this. I will seek this out. Um, you definitely uh, influenced me to, to to seek this out quickly. Cool. Well, I'm glad. Um, so maybe I should have led off with this one because I just realized that I forgot to put something on the list, but I definitely don't want to forget include it in the episode. We have to acknowledge... Um, Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick? Yeah. We have to acknowledge uh, Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman passing um, over this last weekend, or it was either, was it middle of last week? Oh, I think it was Friday night. Yeah, I was saying. I think it was Friday night. Um, and uh, it's real sad. If anyone here is on our like uh, Facebook group, obviously you're real sad you saw that. If anyone follows me on Twitter, I don't know, man, this one hit me differently. Like... I think it's because I there was no reason for Chadwick to to not still be around for a while, at least nothing that we didn't know outside of his private life. And especially when it comes to the fact that, like, we still didn't we were going to get a Black Panther, too. Like, right. It felt as certain as anything in the future can be is like, we're going to get a Black Panther, too. Like, that's going to happen. And so you then take for granted that Chadwick Boseman's a human being and he's not necessarily going to live to that point. And then he didn't. And so. My brain kind of short circuited, and I also still am kind of buzzed out on it a little bit. Yeah, I yeah, I had a very similar experience. I was I was stunned when I saw the headline. It um was kind of similar to you know Kobe's passing. I see the two uh, passings compared a lot on social media over the last couple of days, and it's that same kind of a thing where the the first time I saw the headline, first glance, I was like, no way, that's like one of those joke things. There's no way that. Chadwick Boseman just passed away. Um, yeah, well, when you sent me the headline, I my brain tried to force me to read it as Chadwick's dad. Sure, passed. okay, like, that's fair. It was trying to make it like someone related to Chadwick, his father, maybe someone elderly, something passed, and it's just famous enough to be a headline. But then, like, I reread it, and I was like, no, Chadwick passed. It's like Chadwick what? Boseman himself, the Black Panther. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I was just really, really sad to hear that. I was shocked to find out that he'd had colon cancer for the past four years. Yeah, um, tough, tough motherfucker. Because oh like, goodness, the acting that he's done over the last four years, it's insane. No one would have guessed except for like the last few months where he started to look skinny and whatnot online and people were worried. But like nothing came out and actors lose weight all the time. So it wasn't like any things shocking other than and i didn't even hear about that to be completely honest with yeah you. he just like posted some stuff on instagram and he just looked he, he does look gaunt in them but like as i said like the machinist was christian bale who knew if he was sure. losing weight like extremely for a role or something like there was no not to say that he should have told people about it uh it's obviously his private life he could choose to do with it what he wants but yeah it just kind of came out like a train from a tunnel that i didn't know was there <laughs> I was just crossing a railroad I wasn't aware of. Uh, And uh, obviously our hearts go out to everybody who actually knew Chadwick Boseman, especially family. Um, And I've noticed that uh, all of the Marvel alum have been tweeting and Instagramming. Robert Downey had something to say. Chris uh, Evans, Chris Hemsworth, all of them uh, said some very nice things. Um, The one that had the in terms of just fellow actors, the one that had the best statement was the woman who played Okoye, his bodyguard in Black Panther. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She released a very, a very nice uh, statement, and she seems genuinely uh, taken aback. Is a as a small way of saying what she probably feels. Um, so yeah, real big bummer. Right, man. and it, I, it's it's completely natural as fans uh, to have that like. Uh, oh crap, what are they going to do next in the MCU? Because like, yeah, Black Panther was uh, one of the better parts of the most recent Marvel phase. And I think he was going to um, be a big part 
to moving come. Moving forward. Still, yeah. Yeah, like probably, you know, like headquarters because they, they, they positioned Wakanda to basically even surpass Stark in terms of like technological advancements. Yeah. So I definitely think they have positioned Black Panther and Wakanda to kind of like be home base on planet Earth for the, you know, adventures moving forward. At least that's kind of what I was hoping for. And now, like, what do you do? Yeah, the debate kind of becomes, is it the only way I could see it being a good idea to continue forward with the character of Black Panther in lieu of Chadwick Boseman is if it said, if it was said prior to his passing that he would want it to continue on without him or if his family explicitly unprompted says go. Otherwise... The only real option is to shelve Black Panther for now, somehow. Like, I I don't know how you would justify it in-universe, considering Marvel's kind of built themselves into a corner with having to explain where everyone is all the time. Um, so narratively, I have no idea what I would do. Decency-wise, you can't continue Black Panther without Chadwick, without some sort of precedent established already. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I mean... Maybe just... Maybe shelve him and have him be king of Wakanda, and we just don't go to Wakanda for a while, and his sister is going out in the world, and she's the representative of Wakanda with the Avengers for a while. Like, you know. Yeah, and I mean, that seems like a very fair way to go. I think having his sister take over, like, even even, even if they say in the movie franchise that character passed away or something like that, I, I think I would kind of rather go with kill the character off in the franchise off screen with some type of disease or a training accident gone wrong or something rather than like have a, a warrior confront him and they do a big battle and they he, he ends up killing him like in battle or something. Yeah, like, I think the best they can do is that she can take the mantle of Black Panther while he just stays behind as king. Like he chooses – I'm going to rule. I'm not going to spend time outside the city away from my people. I'm going to rule. Who knows? You be sis. You, you sis, you go be Black Panther. Uh, that's the only real thing I could think of. But yeah. Yeah. And, you know, char- so, okay. So character aside, uh, do you have like a favorite performance of his uh, or maybe a favorite like moment of acting? Um. So I watched 21 Bridges this last weekend. All right. I have not seen that. Uh, pretty good. It's basically... Keanu Reeves' um, Street Kings. It's basically what the plot ends up being. Um, <laughs> but the general idea is in Street King, uh, 21 Bridges, he's got to hunt down some cop killers and they shut down Brooklyn's 21 Bridges to trap them in okay. the city. I remember the trailers. This looked like it could be kind of like a sleeper hit. It's a little long in the tooth. And then when you realize what the actual like plot under the plot is, the movie is basically over already. So it's it's kind of a mixed bag for me. I kind of thought it was like a six or seven. And then I, I watched part of uh, uh, Get On Up, I think is what it's called. Yeah, that's the one where he's singing. I don't remember who he's. He's James Brown. James Brown, yes. Um, the movie itself, the editing around him is not great. The pacing slow. I don't – I got halfway through the movie and I didn't feel like I knew anything more about James Brown than I did previously. Um, especially didn't feel like I was really in the character of James Brown. However – Chadwick Boseman's acting in that movie was phenomenal in the fact that I didn't necessarily connect with the performance, but it was phenomenal that I just forgot I was watching Black Panther on screen. <laughs> like, I forgot it was Chadwick. Like, he did a good job disappearing in the role. Okay. So All when right. it comes to the technical side of it, I would give it to the fact that he did a good job playing uh, James Brown. Uh, he's played some important people. I know you've seen him in Marshall as Thurgood Marshall. Yeah, that's that's probably my favorite piece of acting uh, from him because he's <laughs> – uh, you you haven't seen that movie, right? No, I, it's on my list. Okay. That and the, the Five Bloods are both on my list. So – and and he's he's good in The Five Bloods. I think he's a little more multidimensional uh, in um, in Marshall because the fun the fun thing about Marshall for me – uh, Thur- Thurgood Marshall is on a case and he wants to help out. He wants to come help out on this case as, as a lawyer, but he's not from the area uh, where the court is being held. He's from out of state. He's famous. He's trying to help out this, this individual, uh, who's being accused of a crime. He says he doesn't commit. Uh, so Thurgood Marshall gets flown in and the judge lets him be on the case, but he won't let him speak in the courtroom because he's not... Mm. 
uh, licensed in that particular county. Yeah. And so the uh, person who ends up having to do all the mouthpiece talking stuff uh, is uh, Josh Gad, the guy who voices Olaf. Okay. So it's fun for me to watch uh, Chadwick Boseman boss uh, Josh Gad around like you have to say this and you have to do that and uh, like I'm in charge here even though I can't speak kind of stuff um, and basically like how he has to uh, finesse the situation uh, to get the the trial to go the way that he wants to so it's just it's really really good acting on his part he's really electric and um, magnetic in that performance um, and you know you you kind of see that charm play out in a lot of his roles that there's just something about like his uh, his smile and his charm, uh, there's just something disarming about him. So it's really sad to see him go because he was such a major icon, uh, yeah. kind of in, in birth. Like, I think that, you know, he was uh, on his way to being a a giant, giant presence in the modern Hollywood screens. Um, and so it's sad to lose him. I, I honestly, I think he's the most impactful, like, young actor death since Heath Ledger uh, back in 2008. Um, I know we've lost, uh, a, a few other giant actors since, but just in terms of like someone on the younger side of the scale, an unexpected yeah. young death, both him, it, it, it's just kind of one of those feelings. Like you've seen a few great performances, you know what they could do and just to lose them so young into their career and into their life. It's, it's very, very sad. Yeah. He, he was definitely not to keep like bringing him down to one role, but like I was ready for him to be back, be black, be black Panther for a while. And then, like, retire from the role and come back old man Panther. Like, I was ready for him to age, to be an old man, and then to come back and play old, uh, play Black Panther Logan style. Like, I was ready for that. Honestly, I'm ready for that with everything single superhero I like. <laughs> but Chadwick was Just the give Black it the Panther. Logan treatment. Like, he was the one I wanted to come back as old man Panther. Just like I want Michael Keaton back as old man Bat. Not in the way they're doing, but I want him back as old man Bat. Same thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thurgood Marshall. I need to watch Marshall for sure. I like courtroom dramas. I'm surprised I haven't seen it yet. Um, so yeah, that's that's exciting. So yes, hearts go out to his family, everyone out there. I'm sure it took a moment. Uh, so we wanted to take a moment on the podcast, but I get, we'll get into it now. We'll get into the episode, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, we're going into movies, uh, and so Logan, I feel like I've done most of the talking because I had Bill and Ted already. Fair. So let's. Yeah. Let's jump into one of your recommends. What did you see uh, this last weekend that you enjoyed? Okay, cool. Um, uh, so I've got two things here. The first thing is, honestly, the reason it's in here is because you texted me, hey, uh, let me know how you like this movie. And I never responded to your text, so I'm doing it here. Uh, Woo! I got you. Uh, interview with the Vampire. Um, I was watching this. I want to say it was... Friday night or Saturday night and I was texting John about it uh, and <laughs> he wanted to know like hey how was that I've never actually seen that uh, I'm pretty sure you said something like you think Tom Cruise looks weird in this and Tom so Cruise looks ridiculous in every single like picture I see of the of the movie and that's fair it's just like wh why with the weird vampire eyes and the tea of this Tom get, yep. get stop that Tom Cruise <laughs> yes uh, okay so this uh, movie is uh, <laughs> Interview with a Vampire. It's got Tom Cruise. It's got Brad Pitt. Uh, it's got Thandie Newton in it. It's got Kirsten Dunst, uh, Antonio Banderas. Um, really, really solid little cast. And it's it's pretty much a story where uh, um, Tom Cruise is playing this uh, kind of anti-hero-ish, um, vampire. He's, he's, he's a douche. He's, he's like a douche, but there's definitely some goodness in him, but he's, he's mostly a douche vampire. And, uh, he turns Brad Pitt into a vampire and they become like, like brothers, I guess. Like they they have a very, very <laughs> odd like relationship. Brothers, I guess. <laughs> you say what? I just, I don't know why I thought that was funny. Just like I like brothers, I guess. There's, there's literally no word for their relationship. <laughs> it's it's like they're kind of brothers, kind of like a gay couple, but they're also dead in oh, human vampires. Kind of, kind of. So there's there's definitely <laughs> some vibes. Um, but uh, essentially, Brad Pitt is playing this uh, very like emotionally innocent person. He's a vampire who doesn't want to take life, and so Tom Cruise basically has to convince him like. 
okay, well, if you're not going to kill people, then this is what you have to do. This is how you have to live. You have to basically like live off rats and animals and stuff. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of, okay, let me just, let me just take a step back to high level view. The, the, this movie is a mostly drama. It's mostly period piece drama, but it's kind of, uh, shrouded in a little bit of a horror movie vibe. I wouldn't say there's anything genuinely like horrific or scary or, or jump scariness, nothing like that. It's not like the exorcist mm-hmm. or something, but, yeah. um, not, not, not a horror movie, but there are some of those vibes here. It is a vampire movie. So there are, uh, there's, there's a lot of blood. Um, there's some R-rated stuff that happens, but, it's it's I don't ever really feel like it's meant to scare you or anything like that. Um, but I think it's a lot of fun. I think the performances are completely over the top. Everything is super theatrical. The the makeup uh, <laughs> is uh, is very much ridiculous. Honestly, I just I don't know what it is about eye contacts, but there's something about just bright colored vampire eye contacts that I just I don't get. I I genuinely think the Twilight movies would be like an entire like percentage point better if they didn't have eye contacts. Like there's just something about it that I just don't really care for. Um and so the makeup and interview with the vampire is a little bit cheesy. Uh, but you're pretty much just watching a bunch of bad vampires doing a bunch of bad things. Um and it can be a lot of fun. There's some really dramatic stuff that happens. There's some really uh, brutal things that happen in this movie. Um, so I would I would recommend this. I don't know if you would like it all that much, John, but this is kind of like a... I've only seen it twice now, but it's becoming like a guilty pleasure watch for me. <laughs> and uh, low-key Antonio Banderas and Kirsten Dunst are two side characters that really, really steal the movie. Um, so uh, I, I, My boy Antonio. Say what? I said, my boy Antonio. I still want him for Old Man Zorro. I'm still on that. <laughs> yeah, on that. Old Man Zorro. I would totally be down for that. Um, yeah, he is. He is smoldering in this movie. Like it is one of those. Like yeah, it is one of those uh, performances from him. Um, so <laughs> I would. I would definitely recommend this movie. But <laughs> I don't know that you would like it. But I would recommend. Hey, you it. never know. There I are like some it. movies on my list of likes that I'm surprised myself. I like it. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, since you don't have it avoid, but you do have another recommend, we'll jump to my recommend real quick. And then back to yes. you. Yes. What is in your plus pile? I don't have a whole lot to say about it, um, but that's actually good because it, we went, my wife and I went into this absolutely blind. I was actually kind of expecting something not quite what I got. It's an anime movie about an hour and 15 on Netflix. But the thing is, it's not one whole cohesive movie. It's three short stories. Um... And they're really good. Here's the thing, though. This movie is very melancholy, from melancholy to sad. Like, it's in that scale. Um, And the wife and I weren't ready for that. I clicked on a little unassuming anime movie that had three short stories in it um, and didn't really think about it. But then by the end of it, we were basically an emotional wreck (laughs) Uh, by the end of these three movies. Jeez. uh, Especially after the first and the third one. The second one, okay, well, the first one is about a man who reminisces about his childhood and growing up in the simpler times, mostly focused on the concept of comfort food. What that's why the, I think that's why this movie is called Flavors of Youth, because of the first short story, because he's thinking about how food reminds him of memories. Um, and so you see a lot of his past through the monologue of... Huh, that's an interesting way to tell the story. Yeah, it was it was really pretty. I mean, this animation was top-notch. Uh, and so I enjoyed that. Uh, the second one's about an older, an elder sister who's uh, taking care of slash providing funds to go to uh, college or high school for her younger sister. And the elder sister's a model who's kind of on the outs and has have has a bit of an identity crisis. Um, then, and, and her little sister is untapped potential that she hasn't noticed. And that's that story, basically. Um, it honestly wasn't bad, but it was the most generic of the three. Uh, the third one is, um, the saddest one of the three. Uh, it's, it's about. What, what, what was so sad about it? It's, it, it, it ends upliftingly, but the, the the whole story basically is about three friends. Two of them are boys, one's a girl. The reason why that's relevant is because one of the boys uh, falls for the girl, uh, but doesn't tell her. They don't 
admit anything to each other. There's a nice shtick in this movie of like uh, how they talk to each other. They record uh, a tape. One of them records a response and they hand the tape to each other at school. And then that evening they'll listen to the reply. And then they'll record a response and hand the tape back. So that's how they talk. It's kind of cute. Um, and it is very cute. It's a very interesting story device as well because it creates a delayed communication sure. methodology, which feeds into the plot. There's anticipation and build up and tension. Yeah. It feeds into the plot, and so that was really well done. Um, long story short, things don't work out as their childhood minds would have liked them to. I got to be really vague because it gets really into spoiler town real easy because these are shorts. Um, ultimately, it's just it is it. It's not necessarily sad because oh, one of them dies or something like that. No, it's it is very to- it's told very tastefully, very pretty, and it it's paced. Right, and it just makes you fucking sad about how things don't work out how you hoped they would as a kid. Yeah, that sounds like a bummer of a watch. <laughs> the kind of kind of shit I'm like really good at avoiding. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to be sad. I'm, I'm like, already okay, sad. I watched about Perks life. of a Wallflower. I don't need to cry for like two months. I'm uh, well, Perks of the Wallflower still is like fucking. <laughs> if if Flavors of Youth is a grenade, five uh, fucking Perks of being a Wallflower is a tank. Like that, no, person being a wallflower is still way sadder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> way right. sadder. Hey, remind uh, me to bring that up though, because uh, on a future episode, uh, I, I got Jacqueline to watch that for the first time and we needed to, we need, we need to talk about uh, that. Yeah. that, that, that she that's for that. a future episode, folks. Sweet. Uh, so tune in, follow us. Um, so that brings us to your recommend. I see you got another one over there. Uh, yes, this one uh, is called Into the Grand Canyon. So I am circling right back to my new favorite thing, which is National Geographic documentaries that are on at Disney+. Plus. Um, I am seriously getting addicted to this kind of stuff. Uh, Into the Grand Canyon is one of the better ones that I just wanted to talk about for a quick minute. Um, it's a pretty easy sales pitch. Uh, two guys commit to walking uh, a huge amount of uh, the Grand Canyon, and it takes them a long, long time to do it. They, they break it up. It's not like they're in the Grand Canyon for several months, but it takes them like they, they intentionally visit over the period of a year to experience it at different times of the year. Uh, um, and so the cinematography is just absolutely stunning. Like it's one of those just kind of mind numbingly beautiful, like nature documentaries. Cause you're just in the grand Canyon for like an hour and a half, basically. Um, and there's just some really cool stuff that happens. They go on all kinds of little adventures in the grand Canyon. Um, hmm. so there's, there's several little like side plots and stuff like that. Um, there's like a, a local Native American uh, group that is fighting against commercialization uh, in one area of the Grand Canyon. So that's an area they kind of uh, circle back to a couple of times. Um, there are other like climbers and campers and it's like other scientists that are out there too. So they have like teams that go out and the teams will kind of like connect up and stuff. But primarily it's just focused on these two guys. Um, and it's, it's just it's, it's a really fun documentary. Uh, they're really, uh, Kevin and Peter, the two guys that are in here, they have a really good relationship. They've worked together for a long time. And one of them is particularly funny, uh, with his, his style of bitching. Like when it comes to like being annoyed at the weather or being annoyed at the climb or being annoyed at, you know, like blisters on his toes, like the way he complains is just, it's really funny. <laughs> it's its really, really funny just to watch him just kind of sit there and moan and bitch and stuff because he comes up with some really creative ways to complain. So uh, they've got really good banterns. And, and it's, uh, all I'll say, uh, it, it's, it's a gorgeous documentary. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to see a lot of really beautiful things. Uh, really, really good for calming down uh, anxiety. It's just one of those, you know, nature documentaries that I would uh, really recommend. So I don't know that this thing like blew my mind or told me anything new or convinced me to like change my lifestyle. Like some uh, documentaries try to go for that. But uh, <laughs> this one really did uh, just give me a lot of pleasure to watch. And it, it was a great experience. So I would really recommend checking that out. Sweet. Uh, I haven't consumed a whole lot of Grand Canyon media. I've always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. Same. Um, Never but been. But that's interesting that, that this ended up being such a – when you see into the Grand Canyon, you think of just some deep-voiced guy going, the Grand Canyon is this many miles long, <laughs> and sometimes there are animals in it. 
And that's just the whole thing. And it's just swooping shots of the canyon. Look at those fish. They're being fishes. Yep, those are fishes. Uh, <laughs> so there, cool. there, there is. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's there, there's just there's a lot more to it than that. And it, I I agree with you. I was kind of wondering, is this going to be one of those like uh, documentaries where you see a lot of like drone footage and then a bunch of people sitting in chairs talking in front <laughs> of a bookcase of of books. The Grand Canyon is this interesting anomaly. Like, oh God, okay, we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's it's very much it's it's two guys walking through the Grand Canyon with GoPros. Basically, um, is there's there's obviously there's more to it than that. It is a National Geographic exploration, so there there is like a full camera crew and everything. But uh, the, some of the conditions they're in, like the hikes they make, like oh my gosh, when the camera crew like like pans down when they're like climbing along the sides of the canyon mm-hmm. and stuff, like there's. There, there are some moments where uh, it's it's very, very tense. Cool. So full Sweet. recommend for me. Um, well, that brings me to the bad side of the coin. We're going to the avoids. Um, cool. And, uh, what do we got in the dumpster pile? Well, I've got – it's not – it's, it's, it, admittedly, it's not garbage. I want to risk not pissing off a huge swath of people out there. Um, so When Marnie Was There is a Studio Ghibli film – that came out relatively recently. I'm not sure exactly. I am not out. familiar with this in the slightest. Um, and we saw it on HBO. It was the, we saw that it was on HBO Max, and we thought, hey, let's let's check it out. We call ourselves Studio Ghibli fans, and yep, this came out in 2014, so it's it's new in Ghibli's terms. Um, and we saw the English dub. And it's okay. Here's the thing. Like, I personally think Ghibli's at its best when they're handling more fantastical elements. Not necessarily only when they're in fantasy, but even the quieter movies that they have that handle just, like, one fantastic element. In my opinion, uh, The Secret World of Arietti. The only thing fantastic about that movie in terms of strangeness is little people. Other than that, the world is literally the same. I think that is done better than this film. So basically the plot of this film is a young girl who is uh, not, who is adopted by an aunt, not by blood. So she doesn't have any actual relatives. She just has um, by association. uh, She's been adopted because she lost her parents at a young age. She's textbook depressed, like very detached, very inward, embarrassed about her artwork. Doesn't like to talk to people. Doesn't really open up to anybody. Um, obviously has a lot of emotional entrapment going on. So the, the, her mother or adopted mother, uh, sends her to some, uh, again, I don't think they're a related family, um, in the countryside. And so she goes there and she's going to, uh, a summer school or camp, uh, over the summer while she's there. And she makes a few friends sort of, but things don't go as, the, as planned, and she runs into this girl named Marnie, who she finds in an abandoned mansion across the marsh. Uh, it's kind of like a friendship version of the Great Gatsby. Um, but <laughs> um, it, it's obvious out the gate that Marnie's not really there. Sorry for spoilers, but honestly, the moment you see her, everyone has already made jokes in the movie about the mansion being abandoned in a ghost house. And then suddenly someone's living in there with a whole family and they have parties. I was like, I've seen this a thousand times before. It's a ghost. But the point is, you don't know why the ghost appears to her. And that's the twist at the very end of the movie. So it is um, a real ghost, not like an imaginary friend? You know, I thought maybe it was only unique to her, but other people later in the movie acknowledge oh, weird. Like they acknowledge okay. that okay. It's, a, it's a phenomenon that can't happen. So it's definitely not super unique to her, but the events of the movie are unique in the sense that they have a lot of relevance to her and where she I won't even say that. That's too much of a spoiler right there. It's cool. a lot of relevance okay. to her. All right. No, you're 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 intriguing. Me. Um I'll uh maybe it wasn't in the best mindset, but I would I would say this is on the blander side of Ghibli titles. However, the the story is sweet. Um the animation is very beautiful because it's Studio Ghibli. The voice acting is top notch. I honestly believe that both dub and sub in Ghibli movies are always great. Both. Um, and it's on HBO Max. So if anyone has this missing in their Ghibli lineup and you're a Ghibli fan, I would say watch it. Otherwise, if you're not like chomping at the bit for Ghibli or you're not even that big of an anime person, it may not be for you. Or maybe it just requires you to be in a very particular mood because this is a slower movie as well. 
Yeah, fair enough. This definitely... Uh, it's almost two hours long. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know that I'll love this movie, but this seems like something that I might watch once. Say like, yeah, that was okay. And then I mean, it is kind of like... so. It's kind of like the anime version of like a Lady Bird type story. Not quite. That's not a super great <laughs> comparison. All right. But just in the sense that like, it's a very focused story. It's about this girl. It's about her one summer that she had these specific experiences on. And you watch her grow as a person and where that those types of movies where it's just a character analysis over a very specific amount of time. Mm-hmm. And that is what this is. Um, and those every a lot of know that the can name a movie just like that off the top of their head. I mean, Perks being a wallflower, you could argue is that as well. Um, I would actually say this is relatively close to Perks of being a wallflower uh, in anime style. So, yeah, when Marnie was there, I say avoid, but honestly, it's kind of meh. So that brings us to shows. Yeah, TV shows. All right, cool. Well, thank you for the review on Marnie Was There. What else do you have on the table for today's episode? So uh, I see you don't have any shows this week. Uh, I don't. I, no. <laughs> I, I will say um, I did watch more episodes of that Food Wars anime. I won't really talk about it because I already said my piece. <laughs> it gets less gross. I was just watching it. I was watching more of it because I was like, this will give me a giggle. Uh, and it is funny, but... I mentioned that the first episode, it's very, very uh, adult. Uh, it gets better. And apparently even further than I was, I've read on Reddit, that it gets even milder and milder as you go. I think the okay. the creators of the show obviously used it as like a weird hook at the beginning. And they get you with the sex and then they sell you on the story. <laughs> uh, the opposite of porn. But the uh, – yeah, <laughs> whatever. I just wanted to say that they did kind of redeem themselves. I didn't want to leave them in the dirt if they didn't deserve it. Um, but I am recommending. All right, no, hey, that's completely fair. I think a lot of TV shows uh, tend to be a little raunchy in the first half of the first season because you're right. That does get people to say, I want to keep watching. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I I, I, I watched it in a, further in a humorous manner. But honestly, I also wouldn't have even watched it because of that. The first episode wasn't ridiculous, so it did kind of work. So there you go. Um, But what I am actually recommending this week is just real quick. There's a Netflix original documentary, or at least Netflix takes credit for it, uh, called Greatest Events of World War II in Color. Now, I've seen every – I hesitate to say every. Don't take me literally, but I've seen a lot of World War II documentaries. A lot, including Ken Burns' The War multiple times through, frontwards, backwards, sideways in specific episodes. Um, it's safe to say World War II is probably my favorite historical event, like just a uh, number of years lined up next to each other kind of area. And I know a lot about it. Not to say I know everything. I wouldn't necessarily be a history teacher, but this stood out to me because it's honestly surprised me a few times. Usually like a documentary every once in a while will have a new fact or something in it that I get, uh, or I, I should say that I didn't know before. This one has had solid chunks of entire episodes that I was like, I'm sorry, what? That fucking happened? And then I go Googling and I'm like, wow, that happened in World War II. And that's fucked up. Uh, not to say this is groundbreaking and everyone's going to be shocked by it, especially if you're a World War II enthusiast, but it is good. Uh, it's very comprehensive. It's got a lot of maps. I like maps in World War II documentaries showing where things are shifting and moving. Um, it focuses on different elements of different theaters in the war. You'll learn a little bit about the Japanese and Chinese theater, um, which isn't super talked about in Western media for World War II. No, it's not. It's it's left out a lot. Um, even then, I think you the show kind of glosses over. There is another one on, on Netflix. I don't remember which one it is that goes directly into the Japanese-Chinese conflict, and it is – Oh, it's brutal. Um, Japanese and Chinese don't fuck around when they go to war in World War II. Um, so that that's that's pretty brutal. But yes, greatest events of World War II in color. It's also really cool to see World War II in color. Like it's it's very well done. Yeah, this sounds right up my alley. I've actually looked at this documentary a lot. Like scrolled over it, scrolled over it, scrolled over it, kept going. Uh, you're making me want to click play on it now. Um, so. I, I still have... Did you know the Germans were probably high when they first invaded France? Seriously? Yeah, they were on a um, they were on an upper that was like sold over the counter. It was just like getting caffeine today. Um, but I believe it was methamphetamine. Like oh basically. Gosh. that um, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all though. Like uh, uh, um, 
Germany was not shy about uh, chemical stuff. You know what I mean? Well, that and they, to they fuck with the human body. The Germans went on the offensive for like four days straight. They didn't sleep. They didn't stop for four days straight. They just attacked, attacked, attacked. Blitzkrieg at the very beginning of the European theater. Um, and that makes a lot more sense when you realize they were on meth. Hmm. <laughs> the Germans were the best warriors in the world because they were on fucking meth. <laughs> That's it's such a weird realization. Um, Makes sense to me, of, but yeah, that is kind of weird to think about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Greatest Events of World War Two. You'll get some fun facts like German meth. Um, so I, I recommend it. But that would take us uh, to the podcast recommend. If you, unless you have anything you want to add about my recommend, I have no, no idea. No, other than I, re- I want to watch this now. This is uh, this seems like it'll be right up my alley. Um, and super quick recommend: uh, Hunting Hitler over on H. Uh, no, Hulu, not HBO. Hulu, different H. Um, uh, super cool documentary. Uh, even even if you're not going to open up your mind to the thought of Hitler getting out of World War II alive and dying old in Argentina or whatever, like even if you're, Man, it gets real tough not to get sucked into that. <laughs> yeah, just even even if you're like you're not willing to cross that line, that's fine. This documentary is super fascinating because you'll at least get to see how a ton of other Germans really actually did escape yeah. and set up camps. Yeah, it's fucked up how many actually got away. Yeah, yeah. and this that that di- like so if you're really into World War II, that hunting uh, Hitler documentary is e- even if uh, you watch the whole thing, and you're like, yeah, I still don't believe that Hitler got out. Okay, that's fine because I still don't know what to believe. But neither do I. The Russians really fucked up that that one. Yeah, uh, I, that's the problem. Yep. The Russians made it very blurry on whether or not Hitler was alive, yep. and to this day. We don't know. <laughs> yep. So, but yeah, it's a bit fucked up. A lot of uh, top-notch uh, Nazis did get out, and they did set up stuff um, in South America. And there's proof that some of them are even still running today. So it's super fascinating to uh, to watch. So uh, World War II documentaries will always be a friend of Film Rush. Cool. Uh, so that will bring us to our podcast recommend, where we. Uh, select a independent podcast that's out there in the world and we bring them to you guys to see if it's something that you'd be interested in consuming in addition to this podcast because we're all about expanding horizons of entertainment here so stick around for just a few seconds to see if this is something you'd be interested in and we'll see you back here real quick hi i'm ben the host of dark histories podcast every other week i turn my eye towards the fringe and unsolved aspects of our history In each episode, I dig deep to bring you tales from large cultural events to smaller localised legends, from Victorian poisonings to cults, and from the unknown to the simply unexplainable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and all other platforms, or head directly to darkhistories.com. I hope you'll come join me soon to delve into the underbelly of the strange. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. That brings us to our individual reports where we talk to each other's faces about movies that we had been assigned in the previous week when we were looking at each other's faces last week. So, uh, we just got through my World War II diatribe, so let's go to you, Logan. You watched a little gem of a movie this week. Yeah, uh, this was a really, really rough experience. (laughs) Um, I will admit I did not watch it alongside you. I almost did, but I almost, I I realized I might barf. Yeah. So, uh, (laughs) if, if, if you are uh, around the film community, you've likely heard of and possibly even seen 2010's Birdemic, uh, shock and terror. Uh, this is notoriously one of the worst movies of all time. Uh, John assigned it to me, so I had to watch it. Uh, I did it to he myself. He put it on his list, so I had I to put assign it. On it. List. I, I opened up that opportunity. Um, you did. You you put a crack in the dam, and I just busted it down. Yeah, it. I, I. I I don't know that it would be a whole lot of fun to actually seriously figure out what my like worst movies of all time would be, but this would one hundred percent automatically probably go to the bottom of that list. This was. It's yeah, it's pretty worthy. It's pretty worthy inclusion. Genuinely, the worst movie that I can consciously think that I've seen. I would so much rather sit down and watch uh, the room over this movie for the second time. Yeah. Um, this movie, it's just, it is, it, it's, it's bad. It's flat. It's lifeless. The acting, the characters. This is about the quality, the quality of of 
uh, work that I did with my friends with like a, a GoPro camera when we were in like 10th grade. Like it's that level quality. Yeah, this is shit. Yeah, this this is shit we did with a uh, and I've, I've seen like clips of it. So I'm not like speaking from complete ignorance, but this is shit that we uh, we would do my brother and I with like a fucking tape on <laughs> video tape camera. <laughs> Way back in the old times. Way back in the days. Like, my brother and I tried to make a movie when I was, like, nine uh, about World War Three happening. And we filmed in my dad's office when he worked for a place called Environmental Works. And we, like, filmed my dad as, like, a government official. We tried to play, like, I was a government official in a cubicle and I was nine. <laughs> like, I'd watch that again over Birdemic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yes, Bird Birdemic is it's that bad. Um, what, whatever you've read about it, it really is that bad. It's not one of those, no, really was that bad. And like, no, it's that bad. Uh, CGI is just hilarious it's not not even there like you know when you watch uh super old cart like super old life i'm trying to think of a an example for how bad they are it's it's literally uh like somebody just was on instagram and they dropped like a sticker bird down on the screen on on their photo <laughs> that's literally as simple as i can make it come, come. um the the audio was horrific like literally there'd be two characters walking down the street and everything would be completely silent. There's, like, no score. Completely silent. And then they'd start talking and, like, all of the noise would cut in. So they clearly just weren't using the audio from the entire conversation because they didn't want the street noise in there. But then when they played the vocal audio, uh, it it still had all the street noise. So it would go from complete <laughs> silence to, to you hear someone noise. talking and cars honking and, you know, all that motion and, and city sound. Oh, my God. It's every audio nerd's worst. And that it's just so poorly edited. And the the the, the dialogue is just absolutely horrifying. Um, it is so bad that you almost question the sanity of whoever wrote it because – like the way these the, – the, there's a main character, uh, a guy and a girl. They're, the way they meet, he sees her in a coffee shop and is just completely full-on staring at her in the most obvious way. Like full head turn looks at her as she walks past him to leave. He goes down and chases her down the street and says, hey, you look familiar. We went to high school together. And she's like, oh, we did? You remember that? And he was like, yeah, I sat two chairs behind you. What do you what do you do now? How was your day? They don't exchange names or anything. And then like, hold on, this isn't a real greeting. (laughs) Several minutes into the conversation, they call each other by their names, but they've never actually said like, I'm George or I'm you. I don't remember what their names are because fuck it. Uh, But they're like they introduce themselves. They never actually introduce themselves, but they still knew each other's names. Uh, Cinematography is terrible. It's just. Some of the worst acting, some of the worst directing. It, it 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 genuinely is a student project. It's only notable because of how bad it is. Um, I I don't know. Like, I'm I'm trying to be like clear about how shitty this is. I don't know that I have anything super witty or clever to say about how bad this genuinely is. But all I can say is that it was rough to watch this. There was no joy in it. It wasn't like the room where I could still. F- see that little ball of fucked up joy in the center of that movie uh i yeah a relevant vision of some something sort something <laughs> I, yeah. I i don't see that with this um so i i i hated this experience and would never watch this again and i would honestly like even from a morbid curiosity standpoint i don't think this is worth watching that's uh not surprising um I think, yeah, I think you have to be very smashed to enjoy this movie. I regretted it. It was bad. <laughs> and even then, I think if you're smashed, watch The Room, don't watch Birdemic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen pretty comprehensive clips. This was brought up in film school. Like, my teacher, uh, I think it was Harrison Witt, uh, I think he brought up Birdemic a few times and was like, don't do this ever. <laughs> if you do this, you have to reverse time and never do it. <laughs> like, just don't do this. Uh, so I'm not surprised. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what rating would you give it? Did you give it a number? I can't remember if you said you gave it a number or not. Uh, the lowest possible one <laughs> on 
<laughs> on Letterbox, which is half of one star. So yeah, they don't make I it gave it a give one, it zero, which is a mistake. One out of one out of ten, I think is is the scale. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's basically the scale. Uh, okay, one out of ten. Not surprising. We'll never watch. Must protect myself from pandemic. Uh, so that brings us to. Jojo Rabbit, which is what I watched. Your movie. Uh, did you remind yourself? I know you've seen this before. Did you refresh yourself on this film over the week? I have I have seen this once in theaters. Uh, Jacqueline and I, I almost... Uh, we we I, I had an opportunity to watch this. I didn't take it. Uh, I, I sold Jacqueline on watching tisk, tisk. it. We went to watch it, and then I just thought about it. I knew where this movie ends, and I was like, I don't. I don't need to be in that mind space right now. Like that's just not going to be. So we, 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 we went with something else, but uh, I did not get to watch this movie again, but I have seen this before hmm. and it was only like 10 months ago. So uh, I, I'm very familiar with this movie. I don't think I had as like, uh, I hesitate to use the word traumatic, but it's interesting how you said you didn't want to go to the headspace that this movie was taking you in because yes, while there are, uh, moments in this film that got me. Let, let's go over what it is first. So Jojo Rabbit's based on uh, is is about this little boy, ten years old, named Jojo, um, and uh, he's ten years old and he's in the Hitler Youth, and Hitler is his best friend, his imaginary best friend, played by Taika Waititi, and that's pretty much the stage. He's a fanatic. He believes in the Aryan bloodline. Uh, he doesn't know anything about the Jews other than what Nazi propaganda tells him. So you can imagine. Um, and his goal basically someday is to be in Hitler's guard. He wants to be around Hitler. He loves Hitler. Um, and his mother is a bit, a bit more cool on Hitler. She's not really as into it, it seems, as the boy. And that's basically just the, the position you're set in in the film and the events just go onward. Um, you know, you just see the the downturn of the war or really the upturn for the allies of the war from the perspective of a 10 year old child living in what I assume is Berlin. Um, but I don't know if he lives in Berlin proper because not as much just. Yeah, that I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't remember that. Um, but it's directed, written and acted in by Taika Waititi. So it's imagine a story about a little Nazi boy written by Taika Waititi. I don't know how to explain this movie in terms of tone because it does have sad and dark moments, but it, it, it somehow never feels like it gets pitch black because of the humor. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, somewhere between life is beautiful mixed with moonrise kingdom. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somewhere in there, but it's Taika Waititi humor, which is in and of itself almost, incomparable yeah I, I'm, I'm not really been able to nail it down in terms of like the quick sin one line synopsis um i enjoyed it the humor was good the story was interesting it was well acted across the board everyone did a good job even taika watiti as hitler i didn't like I, I, I didn't buy it at first and you're not really meant to buy it but like I, I got i got down with it by the end of the movie i was over it um he worked fine Sam Rockwell, though, sold this movie for me. Oh, he's so good. Uh, Sam Rockwell was 100% what I was there for. And I'm glad he had it. He's gone for a long period of time in the movie. So don't hit your wagon on him right now if you haven't seen it. But like the parts he's in for, I, I love Sam Rockwell in this movie. Honestly, put Sam Rockwell in anything and I'll consider watching it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I give it like a 7 out of 10. I could see why some people don't like it. Um I've I've talked to a few that say they just weren't really into it. It wasn't really that good in their opinion. But then I've known other people that were like fucking over the moon for Jojo Rabbit. And I can see why. I think I'm just somewhere in the middle, maybe towards the positive side. All right. That's, yeah, I'm uh, in the over the moon category. That is just on one viewing though. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad you still liked it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you were still on the positive side because, yeah, this is kind of one of those movies where if you can get into the sense of humor and the story and the ethics, then you're going to love it. But if something doesn't settle right with you, it's hard to go with this type of movie uh, just because of the way they – they they definitely by by the time it's all said and done, the movie does a good job of of making sure that the Nazis are still bad, like they're not glorified. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't allow the humor to 
to insult by dampening sure. the weight of the material. Like, it's still fucked up. Everything that's happening is still fucked up, even if things are made light. Um, but the film uses the humor in context of the universe rather than injecting our humor onto the event, if that makes any sense. But, like, it, it does a good job of keeping that balance. Yeah, no, that's super fair. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, you Do you want to go into spoilers or do you want to just kind of leave it here in the spoiler-free zone? Yeah, fuck it. I got time codes down in the description anyway, so let's do spoilers. So... Spoiler warning, right here. And if you if you want to know this, when the spoilers Jojo end, rabbit. just go down into the description. Uh, I don't remember if iTunes and Spotify have descriptions, um, but I know SoundCloud does. So you'll see where spoilers start and where spoilers end. Just jump forward if you don't want to hear them. Otherwise, welcome to the spoiler zone. Uh, so what is it you want to start off on with the, the spoilers? Well, I, I don't feel like you can get into a, a, a genuine review of the movie, like an actual critique of the movie at least, um, without talking about the the Jew girl that's living in the attic. Mm-hmm. I feel like that is is where the movie hooks me line and sinker. The Jew. Uh, the, the rest of it, like, it, it's, it's fine window dressing, but the heart of that movie for me, man, is when – uh, I do not remember character names, but uh, it's it's when the Nazi boy kind of discovers her in the attic and then has this confrontation with her about what to do. And he's like, I'm going to report you. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, think that through. What's going to happen, huh? Like, you're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Um, this is where you're going to be at in life if you report me. But if you don't, like, there, that, that just that whole interaction, I, I just absolutely loved it and how, how he kind of like – for a while continues to go back to her to like try to kind of argue with her, but then also like kind of wants to become friends yeah. with her and stuff. But like, we'll ask her like one really awkward curiosity kind of question, but then like just insult her right back to her face. And so like, I don't know. I just, I thought that their relationship and dynamic was what saved the movie or not what saved the movie, but what like made it stand out to me. Um, what, what did you think about that? And then follow question thoughts on Scarlett Johansson's performance. Um, okay. So going off of the Jojo Elsa relationship, I'm looking at the IMDB cast. I'm not just showing you up or anything. Nice. I remember all of their names. No. Um, so Jojo and Elsa, both great performances. Honestly, Jojo did a fantastic job in this movie playing a, a child who's been brainwashed. He's been brainwashed into believing the Nazi propaganda. So he thinks Jews have horns that grow out of their heads. He thinks that he thinks <laughs> that they lay eggs. He thinks all this crazy, obvious horse shit. Um, but it, to such a genuine degree that it's disconcerting because you could hear someone say something, but then when you see them believe it, that's a bit that shakes you a little bit. You're like, wow, you really shouldn't believe that. Um, that's 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 Jojo in a nutshell. Through this whole movie, he'll say some stuff about. Jews or just anyone in general that's not a Nazi or an Aryan um, that just took me off guard a few times because you're just not used to hearing it uh, in in civilized society. Um, so that was good. Their relationship was solid. I did like that the film and the actors and the script did a great job of slowly eating away at his um, psychosis, his his brainwash. Yeah, that makes just, like, sense. Each yep. scene you could see like a like a chink of the armor was hit. Like, boop, there's a little bit of that, yep. boop, a little bit of that. And it's just like cracking over time till inevitably it will shatter. Um, which, by the way, it shatters pretty spectacularly <laughs> with a fucking kick. <laughs> um, that was that was pretty fantastic. It sure does. <laughs> Hitler went flying through the fucking window. Um, and I liked that scene a lot. That was because I was like, he's, he's broken out because he's brainwashed. He's in a cult. The Nazis were a cult. And it's it's good to see someone get out of a cult. Um, Scarlett Johansson's performance was great. Uh, I have full faith in her being able to act ever since I saw Marriage Story. Um, and I think she was nominated for both Marriage Story and Jojo Rabbit in the same year. She might have been. I think I remember. I, th- I think I remember that. Yeah, she was because she won for. I think she Marriage won for Marriage Story, Story um, which was justified. I don't care what anyone says. She did a great job in that movie. Um, she did great. In this as Rosie. Um, I'm going to look it up now. She had she had a lot going on under the surface. That's the thing about her character in this movie is because she's not in it a lot in terms of um, minute count. And she doesn't have a whole ton to say when she's on screen. She has It's a lot of banter between her and her 10-year-old son who she is aware has been brainwashed and she wants to get him out of it. But there's no 
way to do it, at least not in the obvious way to her eyes. So she's just slowly trying to keep him centered while he's going through this crazy time to try and get him out on the other side as a normal boy. But, you know, that's kind of got a mixed result. Um, and then, yeah, she she dies in this movie. Mm-hmm. And that was... That, that it was sudden. and was very surprising and sudden to me. I, and it was it, sad. The performance did well, and I, and I get why the script did it, and it makes sense. But at the same time, it happened so fast, so sudden, and then, like, nothing happens from it that it kind of just felt like an isolated scene by itself. Yeah, I kind of had that same feeling. I was expecting there to be more uh, events to transpire a, uh, from that yeah. happening. And it, there, there, there wasn't as much to do with that It was just a fact of life after, scene after Yeah. Like, it was like, oh, your mom's dead now. Yeah, I thought it's, they were going to deal with that a little bit more, but well, they just kind of moved I, on. I think the movie whiffs on it a little bit because they have the Gustapo, the SS, come in and scan his house. And they have that mm-hmm. whole scene with Elsa and the SS, which was great scene, by the way. And I love Sam Rockwell in that scene as well. Everyone did great. Um, Stephen Merchant as Dietz. Yeah, and who's who is the, the really creepy Nazi guy? Stephen who, Merchant. Who, He's uh, in Logan as um, the guy yeah, that's helping them. That's right. I knew he looked familiar. He uh, he did a great job. That was a great scene. And then it's right after that scene that he runs across his mom hung in public because I assume she they found out she was a sympathizer. I don't know if they found that out because they hunted her down because the son said she's out and then they found her doing something or if they found something in the house that they didn't mention or what. But there was no reason to suspect that she was going to get caught prior to that. The SS search the house, seemingly find nothing and are pleased as they leave. Then the next scene, basically, she died and we didn't see it happen. We don't know why it happened. I couldn't even read like the tag that they leave on the bodies out there. I don't speak German. So I don't know what the tag said. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people who don't speak English feel my pain when it comes to movies. Um, But like, I I don't know what the tag said. So I don't know exactly why she was killed. And so I was like, okay, well, this is very sad. But then he gets to stay in the house. No one comes for him. I figured like the Nazis would put him in some sort of Nazi um, (laughs) uh, orphanage or something. But no, he just stays in the house. So I don't know exactly why it happens, and it just kind of feels like the movie just didn't want to deal with her anymore. Yeah, uh, my memory of the movie does kind of fade out a little bit after that, and it has been almost a year since I've seen it. But um, I remember feeling like the movie could have maybe ended a little bit earlier. Well, yeah, because after she dies, he stays in his house with Elsa for a while. Like, it's a montage, basically, seeing them uh, run out of money, basically, and start having to scavenge and go through the trash. His clothes get poorer, uh, but he still stays in the house. So, like, time passes, and he just lives in his house that the Nazis forgot. Hmm. Uh, I guess you're supposed, to, you're supposed to figure that they got their hands tied by the fact that, after a while, they literally lose the war. You see the war end. You see the the Russians come in, the Americans come in. Um, you see Sam Rockwell uh, defeated, um, which great scene by the way between him and Jojo. The last scene between uh, Sam Rockwell and Roman Griffin Davis, who played Jojo, uh, fantastic scene. That one scene, I think, was why this movie is special. I, you know, I've been I've been harping on it a little bit, um, but I think this scene encompasses why this movie is special because. Sam Rockwell's playing a Nazi. He's playing Captain Klesendorf. Um, and he is a goofy figure, to be sure. Like, he's Sam Rockwell. He's got some elements of goofiness to him. But he is not hiding the fact that he is a Nazi, which is pretty hard to get around. But the dialogue and Sam Rockwell's performance and the directing make a Nazi someone you can sympathize with and also be aware that he deserves what happens. And yet... He's not all bad, but he is bad because he's a fucking Nazi. Like I know, it's complicated. Th- that's, that's why this movie is the way it is. It's just like, wow, I can't – I love Sam Rockwell and his performance was great. He was an endearing person. He doesn't sell out Elsa because Sam Rockwell figures out that she's not there uh, uh, legally. He knows she's probably a Jew, but he doesn't sell him out. So like you're like, well, okay, well, are you a Nazi? <laughs> Should you – 
Hey, do you kill Jews or no? Like, I, you obviously support the system, so you are a scumbag. But, like, what the fuck am I supposed to be feeling? Um, so that's the, I like that element of the movie as well. Nice. Um, I don't know that I have anything else to add, so I'm kind of ready to move on over to assigning each other some homework. Cool. Unless you've got any final comments about Jojo Rabbit. No, those were my comments. If that sold you on watching or not watching it, uh, I'm glad and I'm sorry. Um, still check it out if it sounds at all interesting to you. I think Jojo Rabbit's worth the gander. But otherwise, I'll go ahead. Do you want to go ahead and assign me or do you want me to go ahead and assign you? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and assign you with something. Um, cool. Nightcrawler. I am very excited to see that this is on your Ooh. list. Finally appeared on Netflix. I had heard rumors that it was coming to Netflix for a while. Okay. Um, All right. But I, I didn't believe them until I saw it, and then I was like, "Oh, this is the movie that every single time I see my brother, he asks me, have you seen Nightcrawler?' <laughs> every time I say no, and he's like, "Well, why the fuck not?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Okay, stop attacking me." <laughs> um. So now I'll finally be able to say, "Yes, I've seen Nightcrawler. Why the fuck do you keep asking me about it?" Nice. Um, so you clearly are familiar with the movie. Uh, for those not familiar, Nightcrawler is a 2014 thriller, uh, starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, he plays a character named Louis Bloom, who- Gyllenhaal. Who is- Louis Bloom is a weird fucking dude, man. He is a little bit psychotic, very narcissistic, very cold, uh, emotionally. Um, and he's kind of like a, a, a shady broke guy who can't seem to get a job even at the worst places. And he kind of becomes aware of late night, um, uh, what's the right, I don't know what the right term is. Uh, he essentially becomes aware of getting accidents caught on film and then selling it to news stations. That be like, it's a very, very niche thing yeah, to say. But that, indie, he's an indie news camera guy. Video. There's a, there's a title for it. Yeah. There's a freelance, uh freelance cameraman or something like that. Freelance. Yeah. Something like that. A, a crime scene. <laughs> I don't know. Not photographer, I, but anyway, uh, I didn't he, go into he, journalism, y'all. I don't know. <laughs> he 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 basically plays a really creepy, psychotic dude who sits in his car, listens to the police scanner, and when he hears that there's something morbid, like a murder or a shooting or something like that, he goes to the scene as quick as fucking possible. And will sidestep any legalities that he can in order to get the best shot possible. So he literally, there's a few crime scenes. He literally rearranges the crime scene so it gets a better photo or a better video. I've heard that's a no-no. <laughs> so he can sell it and make more money because it's more shocking. Um, and it is it is very uncomfortable. He is mm. very manipulative. Uh, very, I don't know that I would say violent, but scary like this is one of those performances i can't believe Jalen hall did not get nominated for this because he is unedged there is like a shade of light in his eyes in this movie that like you don't normally see in humans and it's creepy uh this is a really off-putting performance by Jalen hall um uh, no <laughs> a few other good good faces in here but i'm this might be my favorite Jalen hall performance it is certainly one of them um, but if, if you have the perception of, oh, Jake Gyllenhaal, that's that guy from, uh, the Prince of Persia and love and other drugs and, uh, <laughs> source code and Spider-Man, like there's, there's another side of Gyllenhaal you haven't seen. And this, this is one of my favorite yeah. performances by him. Interesting. I'm kind of hoping that I'm not huge on like the creepy performances. Uh, Gyllenhaal, I know has been known for some pretty unhinged performances. Uh, I know one of them was the, um, the spider movie. I can't remember what it was called. Identity. No. Enemy? Enemy, yes. Enemy. Yeah, um, I agree. That was more on the snoozier side of thrillers. That was a rough one to get through. Um, though I will say that I like his um, his performance in Prisoners. True, I yeah. Right, yeah. I, 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 I thought that he was too. really good in that. Um, so he's a good actor. Detective Loki. And I've been told to watch this movie, obviously, as I said at the outset. So, okay, cool, cool. I'll, I'll go into this with... Uh, with caution so that I don't oversell myself on the Gillen Howlin. Um, that's kind of how you say his name, anyone. Look it up on YouTube. He has a very strange last name. Uh, <laughs> it is. So we'll get to your assigning. So I felt bad about giving you uh, the worst movie in existence. Um, so <laughs> I figured you deserved a silly romp 
in an alternative universe far, far away. Uh, and that is Spaceballs. Uh, Spaceballs! I've never seen this. Such a Star Wars fan, and considering you're a Star Wars fan, I feel like Spaceballs, by default, is kind of a must-watch. I've seen it even, and I never sought it out. Um, it's It's cute. It's literally, I think it was made in the 80s. I'm pretty sure. Uh, 1987. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's technically correct. Like it's five years movies. after Return of the Jedi came out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, it's space balls. Like, I, I know some of the jokes. I've seen some of the YouTube clips. You can't um, help but get spoiled just on the GIFs and memes alone. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is an iconic movie. This is a, a comedy classic. Not every, I, I recognize not everybody loves this, but uh, it is incredibly popular. So I'm excited to check this out. Um, I mean, it. you know, Mel Brooks, John Candy, Rick Moranis, Bill Pullman. Like, what the yeah, hell? Yeah, it's got like, our president, it's, Bill Pullman. Right, Bill Pullman's our president, right? Isn't that uh, that, that Bill Pullman's my president? <laughs> he's always he's always the president. The president. <laughs> uh, he's he's in here as Lone Star. So yeah, I, I mean, some of the jokes I already know that I'm go- are, are going to make me giggle. But uh, I'm glad that I'm finally going to check this out. I don't know that I am going to expect to absolutely love this. This is obviously you know. Uh, been around for quite some time, so I'm curious if I'll actually like this or not. Uh, but I'm very excited to watch Spaceballs uh, all the way through for the very, very first time because I'm super unfamiliar with this movie uh, just in general. Uh, so I am glad you approve. Uh, hopefully, you have a better experience with this one than you did Birdemic. I expect you will. Oh, I'm sure um, I will. But otherwise, that brings us to the end of the episode. This is when we tell you to subscribe, to follow, to do everything in your power to appease our greed. No, but we really appreciate uh, you guys listening. Uh, Any likes, comments, or follows. If you guys enjoy this content, we'd love to have you along for the ride. Uh, If you want us to watch anything specifically on any streaming services, uh, whether it be from like Netflix, Disney, Hulu, HBO Max, Amazon, we've got all this jazz so we can watch a huge list of stuff if you have any interest in getting our feedback uh, on any specific title um, otherwise follow us on facebook or twitter uh, or email us all the links are down in the description if you want to follow us elsewhere um, thanks for spending your time with us we hope to see you next wednesday for another episode